bankruptcy. Good morning, everybody. Chapter 22 of Miller. Chapter outline. Bankruptcy code. Chapter 7. Liquidation. Chapter 11. Reorganization. Bankruptcy relief under Chapter 13. And Chapter 12. Learning objectives. What are the two main goals of bankruptcy? In a Chapter 7 bankruptcy, what happens if a court finds there was substantial abuse? How is the means test used? In a Chapter 11 reorganization, what is the role of the debtor in possession? How does the Chapter 13 bankruptcy differ from bankruptcy under Chapter 7 and Chapter 11? The Bankruptcy Code. United States bankruptcy law attempts to balance the rights of the debtor and his creditors by establishing two main goals. To protect a debtor by giving him or her a fresh start without creditors' claims, and to ensure equitable treatment of creditors who are competing for a debtor's assets. Bankruptcy proceedings are held in federal bankruptcy courts, which are under the authority of United States District Courts. Rulings by bankruptcy courts can be appealed to the district courts. Why is this scheme used in the federal courts? Because bankruptcy is covered under the Constitution of the United States as a subject which is exclusively to be handled under federal jurisdiction. The Bankruptcy Code is contained in Title 11 of the United States Code, the USC. It's statutory, and it has eight so-called chapters. Chapter 7 provides for liquidation proceedings. That is, the selling of all non-exempt assets and the distribution of the proceeds to the debtor's creditors. Chapter 11 governs reorganizations, which are not the same as liquidation. Uh, under a reorganization, the debtor continues uh, in business after the termination of the bankruptcy. Chapter 12, for family farmers and family fishermen, and Chapter 13 for um, individuals provide for adjustment of the debts of parties with regular income. They are repayment plans. The Bankruptcy Code calls for special treatment of what are known as consumer debtors. Consumer debtor is one whose debts consist primarily of debts that were incurred for the purchase of goods for personal, family, or household use. The Bankruptcy Code requires that the clerk of the court give all consumer debtors written notice of the general purpose, benefits, and costs of each chapter of bankruptcy under which they may proceed. The clerk must provide consumer debtors with information on the types of services available from credit counseling agencies. The essential objective of having the clerk of the court provide this information to the consumer debtor is 
somewhat to attempt to shame the consumer debtor into choosing a uh, Chapter 13 proceeding instead of a Chapter 7 proceeding um, under circumstances where they're eligible for both so that the creditors of the consumer debtor might receive uh, slightly more money under Chapter 13 than they would have under Chapter 7. Following up on that concept, the Bankruptcy Abuse Prevention and Consumer Protection Act, which again um, is not necessarily there to protect the consumer, but is there to make certain kinds of creditors feel better about the bankruptcy code. Uh, it makes it more difficult for debtors to obtain a fresh start financially by imposing certain requirements on debtors who make more than a certain amount of money uh, and also um, forcing all debtors who want to use the liquidation process to go through a means testing uh, process ahead of time to determine whether or not they're eligible to file a Chapter 7. Uh, bankruptcy process has become more time consuming and costly uh, here in these last couple of decades because of this. Uh, the changes in the law have left many Americans unable to obtain any kind of debt relief by imposing these new requirements. Of course, we'll see whether or not in light of the changes that are taking place in this country as a result of the pandemic, whether or not Congress will offer some additional relief to the consumer debtor in order to provide more opportunities for liquidation as a result of the economic stresses that are about to take place. So Chapter 7, which is liquidation, uh, under Chapter 7, the most familiar type of bankruptcy proceeding and is often referred to as an ordinary or straight bankruptcy. Simply put, a debtor in a liquidation bankruptcy turns all of their assets over to a bankruptcy trustee who is a person appointed by the court to manage the debtor's funds. And I should say that when we refer to it as all assets, it's non-exempt assets. Uh, there are a considerable number of exemptions, which vary state by state by state, um, which the debtor is able to keep and does not have to turn it over to the trustee. Uh, the trustee sells the non-exempt assets and distributes the proceeds to creditors. With certain exceptions, the remaining debts are then discharged. Uh, which is extinguished, and the debtor is relieved of the obligation to pay the debts. From the point of view of students, one of the most significant debts, which is rarely, if ever, discharged in a bankruptcy, is a student loan. A straight bankruptcy may be commenced by the filing of a petition in bankruptcy, the document that is filed with the bankruptcy court to initiate bankruptcy proceedings. The debtor files the petition. It is a voluntary bankruptcy. Virtually all consumer or individual bankruptcies are voluntary bankruptcies. If one or more creditors files a petition to force the debtor into bankruptcy, then it is an involuntary bankruptcy, which, as I say, in the case of individuals, is extremely rare. Voluntary bankruptcy. A debtor who finds himself unable to pay debts as they become due, which is the test that the bankruptcy court imposes in order to determine whether or not you're even eligible to file bankruptcy, may voluntarily petition for bankruptcy relief by submitting a list of all secured and unsecured creditors, their addresses, and the amount owed to each. 
accompanied by a statement of the debtor's finances, including a list of all property, real property and personal property, earned by the debtor, including property which the debtor claims is exempt. Uh, also, a list of current income and expenses, proof that the debtor has gone through pre-petition uh, credit counseling, proof of payments received from employers within 60 days of filing the bankruptcy petition, an itemization of monthly income, and a copy of the debtor's federal income tax return for the most recent pre-petition uh, tax year. Debtor may be required to file a tax return at the end of each tax year while the case is pending and to provide a copy to the court. A request for a copy may be made by the court or by the U.S. trustee, a government official who performs administrative tasks that a bankruptcy judge would otherwise have to perform. I should mention that in the case of a Chapter 7, the proceedings don't take more than, generally speaking, a few months. So filing a tax return during the pendency of the bankruptcy may or may not take place. In the case of a Chapter 13, which is a repayment plan, uh, it's likely that multiple tax returns will come due and will have to get filed. Um, the substantial abuse and the means test. Purpose of the means test is to keep higher income people from abusing the bankruptcy process by filing for Chapter 7. If a debtor's recent monthly income is below the median income in the geographic area in which the person lives. The debtor usually is allowed to file for Chapter 7 bankruptcy as there is no presumption for those people of bankruptcy abuse. If the debtor's income is above the median income, then further calculations have to be made. So obviously, a debtor who is filing for bankruptcy um, in the state of California is able to make a considerably larger amount of money without a presumption of abuse than one who lives in, say, West Virginia or Arkansas, which are much, much poorer uh, states. Uh, the goal is to determine whether the person will have sufficient disposable income after paying living expenses over the next 60 months, which is five years, to repay at least some of his or her unsecured debts. A Chapter 7 filing may also be dismissed if the debtor tries to hide the proper documents. If the debtor has been convicted of a violent crime or drug trafficking offense, or if the debtor fails to pay post petition child and spousal support. If the voluntary petition for bankruptcy is found to be proper, the filing of the petition itself uh, will constitute an order for relief. The court's grant of assistance that relieves a debtor of the immediate obligation to pay debts and imposes something that's known as the automatic stay on all creditors from attempting to recover any money from the debtor. What I just said, additional grounds for dismissal include being convicted of a violent crime or drug trafficking, failing to pay post-petition domestic support, and the order for relief is a court's grant of assistance to a debtor in bankruptcy that relieves the debtor of the immediate obligation to pay debts, which, as I just said, is ordinarily called uh, the automatic stay.
Nifty chart 22-1, here we see the inputs into the property of the estate, which is collected and distributed by the trustee. Here are the debtor's not exempt property. Property is transferred in a tax in transactions that are voidable by the trustee. Uh, these include things like um, uh, debts that were owed to the debtor's relatives that were paid off in preference to the relatives during a certain period of time prior to the bankruptcy instead of being paid generally to all of the creditors uh, or amounts of money uh, over $600 that were paid to certain creditors rather than being distributed evenly to all the creditors. Uh, certain other after acquired properties such as money that gets inherited within a few months after the filing of the bankruptcy by the debtor. Uh, proceeds and profits from all of the above. These all go into the funds that are taken over by the trustee. The trustee pays first and foremost the secured creditors of the debtor, and hopefully you remember something from the last lecture about secured creditors. Then after that, the money is distributed to unsecured creditors. And there are priorities that are applied as to which unsecured creditors get paid what and when. Um, we have a list here of some of the things that have uh, limited priorities depending upon what they are. They're not, you know, it's not like you have to pay off all of the wages and salaries that are owed by the debtor. That's not the case. You pay some of them rather than paying uh, some of the other folks. Um, same thing for each of these categories. And then ultimately, if there's any money after all of the unsecured creditors are paid out of these non-exempt um, and other assets that are handled by the trustee, the debtor actually might, just might, get some of their money back. Involuntary bankruptcies. Now bear in mind that these are rare because they can be expensive for the creditor who actually wants to come in and force a debtor into a bankruptcy. First of all, debtors, creditors have to get together. If a debtor has 12 or more creditors, the petition must be filed by three or more creditors having unsecured claims totaling at least $15,775. Slide for some reason says $15,325. These numbers change annually um, and they go up. If a debtor has fewer than 12 creditors, the petition must be filed by one or more creditors having unsecured claims, again, totaling $15,575, not $15,325. If a debtor challenges the bankruptcy, the court will hold a hearing will enter an order against the debtor if the debtor is generally not paying their debts as they become due, which is the fundamental test for whether or not um, a debtor is entitled to a bankruptcy, or a general receiver, custodian, or assignee took possession of or was appointed to take charge of substantially all of the debtor's property within 120 days prior to the filing of the bankruptcy petition. That is almost invariably going to take place in a business context rather than in the context of an individual debtor. While theoretically that could happen with an individual, um, it really is extraordinarily unlikely that that would, would, would be the case. Okay, 
Here's what I was talking about as a former bankruptcy practitioner, the automatic stay. Once a bankruptcy petition is filed, virtually all other litigation and other actions by creditors or potential creditors against the debtor or the debtor's property are suspended until the bankruptcy is resolved and the stay is lifted. If a creditor knowingly violates the automatic stay, any party injured thereby is entitled to recover actual damages, costs, and attorney's fees from the violator. So, if a creditor violates the automatic stay, they do so at their hazard. Uh, the adequate protection doctrine, a secured creditor may, while the bankruptcy is pending, the debtor is still in the bankruptcy, move to lift the stay against its collateral if the creditor's interest in the collateral is not adequately protected, or if the debtor has no equity in the collateral and it's not essential to the, to the debtor's successful reorganization. In other words, if you got a piece of secured property and the debtor is not continuing to make the um, periodic payments that are due on the loan on the, on the secured property. So you got a mortgage, the debtor is no longer making their mortgage payments. You have a car, the debtor is no longer making the monthly payments on, on the automobile. Uh, the creditor is enabled to come in and say, I'm not being adequately protected as to this secured loan. So, bankruptcy court, lift the automatic stay and let me go in and foreclose on their house or hook their car and take it away. Now, they can't do this on their own. Creditor is not entitled to simply do it on their own. They have to have permission in order to do it. But one of the huge changes that took place with regard to the bankruptcy code uh, when, when it was altered a few years ago was to make it much, much, much more difficult for debtors to um, hang on to um, secured property uh, during the pendency of the bankruptcy proceeding without going ahead and making adequate protection payments. To make it far more, well, What's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, far easier for a creditor to uh, win automatically rather than having to jump through hoops in order to achieve adequate protection. All right, here are some of the exceptions to the automatic stay. The bankruptcy code provides the following exceptions. Collection efforts can continue for domestic support obligations. That would be child support, uh, alimony, and the like, which include any debt owed to or recoverable by a spouse, a former spouse, a child of the debtor, that child's parent or guardian, or a governmental unit. Proceedings against the debtor related to divorce child custody or visitation, domestic violence, and support enforcement are not stayed. Investigations by a securities regulatory agency can continue. So if they're after you because you were engaged in insider trading, they don't have to stop just because you file uh, a voluntary petition in bankruptcy. Uh, certain statutory liens for property taxes are not stayed. Um, so if they're about to sell your property off because you didn't pay your taxes three years ago, um, that probably can continue. If a creditor or other party requests relief from the stay, the stay will automatically terminate 60 days after the request unless the court grants an extension or the parties agree otherwise. This didn't used to be the law. You actually had to go ahead, have a hearing, and have the court order that the automatic stay was going to terminate. 
The automatic stay on secure property terminates 45 days after the creditor's meeting, which is also called a 341 meeting, unless the debtor redeems or reaffirms certain debts. And again, that's something that didn't necessarily take place in the olden days. So what do we mean by the term estate in bankruptcy? Well, it's sort of like talking about a decedent's estate, um, which is an estate in probate. Uh, we're talking about the property. All this is that the person is dead. Uh, once a bankruptcy proceeding begins, following legal and equitable interests and in property subject to certain exemptions become property of the estate in bankruptcy. Um, meaning basically it's going to be administered by somebody other than the debtor who was the owner of the property. Um, one of those things, not included on a slide, which I think has a lot of importance as a practical matter, would be tax refunds. Um, another one, for example, would be a stimulus payment that the government is making. That's not exempt in bankruptcy. So a 1200 or larger payment that the United States is making to all of its adult citizens who met certain criteria um, would be property that would be property of the bankruptcy estate um, unless there is an election to include it in exempt property community or jointly held property is now part of the bankruptcy estate tenancy by the entireties is a different concept that's uh, included in most of the eastern states which may or may not necessarily have some aspect of being included in the bankruptcy estate uh, as a matter of the concept behind who actually owns the property. In the case of, of uh, property, property that's owned by the entireties. Uh, and we can get into more detail about that if any of you are, are genuinely interested in it. Uh, property that is transferred in a transaction that's voidable by the trustee. Again, as I was talking about before, there are certain kinds of transactions, say transfers made by a debtor to their relatives uh, or that are made um, larger than a prorated transfer to certain creditors. Those can be voided by the trustee. Uh, proceeds and profits from the use or sale of property of the estate. So if some property of the estate is rental property and somebody has managed to collect rents well in advance of a month-to-month -month rent. So you know, right before you file bankruptcy, you manage to collect a year's worth of rents from somebody. Um, that's going to come in and be part of the estate. Uh, certain acquired property to which a debtor has become entitled within 180 days after filing. Uh, and again, chiefly what we're talking about here is property that you inherit. So if you are uh, lucky or unlucky enough to uh, inherit uh, money from a person who dies within 180 days after you file a um, bankruptcy proceeding, that money is not going to go to you. It's going to go into the bankruptcy estate to be administered by the trustee and very likely paid out to your creditors. So who is this seemingly obnoxious person known as the bankruptcy trustee? who is evidently here to look out for the interests of creditors and not really the interests of the debtors. Well, ordinarily, they're also really looking out for their own individual financial interests as a trustee because 
um, well, a Chapter 13 trustee does get paid based on monthly payments that come in from the debtor's um, monthly payments that are made over up to 60 months. Uh, the Chapter 7 trustees, or the trustees who handle liquidations, they make their money based on whatever the court allows them to make um, as a result of what they manage to collect in the way of non-exempt assets that they turn around, administer, and, and, and are able to um, process potentially for payment to creditors. So the trustee is required to review promptly all of the materials filed by the debtor to determine if there is substantial abuse. And for that, they receive a very small amount of money that is paid by the debtor at the time that they file their case. Uh, the trustee has the power to require persons holding the debtor's property at the time the petition is filed to deliver the property to the trustee. The power of a trustee, which is equivalent to that of a lien creditor, is known as the strong arm power. The trustee has specific powers of avoidance, which enable the trustee to set aside, avoid or cancel a sale or other transfer of the debtor's property and to take the property back for the debtor's estate. A trustee steps into the shoes of the debtor. Thus, any reason that a debtor can use to obtain the return of his or her property can be used by the trustee as well. Grounds for recovery that a trustee can use include fraud, duress, incapacity, mutual mistake. Some of the things that we've reviewed in the past in connection most of the time with, with contracts. With a reasonable time, after the order of, the, of relief has been granted by the bankruptcy court, not more than 40 days, the trustee must call a meeting of the creditors listed in the schedules filed by the debtor. The, um, that's called a 341 meeting. Um, the bankruptcy judge does not attend this meeting. In fact, he's, he or she is prohibited by law from attending that meeting. But the debtor must attend and submit to an examination under oath if any of the creditors that are present want to ask any questions. In general, those examinations under oath are very brief. If uh, the meetings themselves, by and large, take no more than a few minutes. To be entitled to receive a portion of the debtor's estate, each creditor normally will file something called a proof of claim with the bankruptcy clerk um, within 90 days of the creditor's name. There are a lot of similarities between uh, bankruptcy that way and a probate process, which again is um, you know, utilizes a person who steps into the shoes of one who is no longer present. And in the case of probate, it's a decedent, it's a person who has died. So, in a way, you could even consider a bankruptcy, particularly a liquidation, to be um, the financial death of the person who, who had gone before. Okay. All right, what are preferences? A debtor is not permitted to make a property transfer or a payment that favors or gives a preference to one creditor over others. To be a preference, the transfer must be made in exchange for something other than current consideration. So it's not an out-and-out -out sale. The trustee is allowed to recover payments made both voluntarily and involuntarily to one creditor in preference over another. If a preferred creditor, one who receives a preferential transfer from the debtor, has sold the property to an innocent third party, the trustee cannot recover the property from the innocent party, but the trustee can generally force the preferred creditor to pay the value of the property. Sometimes. 
a creditor receiving a preference is an insider, meaning any individual, such as a relative or a partner, a partnership or corporation, with a close relationship with the debtor. In this situation, the avoidance power of the trustee is extended to transfers made within one year before filing. A trustee can avoid fraudulent transfers or obligations if they were made within two years of the filing of the petition or if they were made with the actual intent to hinder, delay, or defraud a creditor. Exemptions. And this is probably the most important aspect uh, to be considered by potential debtors, particularly debtors who are liquidating under Chapter 7, because as a matter of state law, there are enormous differences between the exemption packages that a debtor can obtain depending upon what state uh, they've spent the majority of the last year in. Um, there is a, a scheme for federal exemptions, which um, incorporate particular amounts for certain kinds of assets. Um, there's a limitation under the federal scheme for an amount of equity in a home, um, uh, a meta, uh, motor vehicle, uh, there's some reasonably necessary household goods and furnishings, jewelry, tools of the trade, uh, unpaid but unearned wages, pensions. None of these things are, 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 are unlimited under the federal exemption scheme. Um, public benefits such as Social Security, welfare benefits, unemployment compensation, uh, and personal injury awards fall under the federal exemption scheme. State exemption schemes may be similar or may not be similar. So Florida is going to have a completely different exemption scheme, particularly when it comes to uh, a homestead exemption in your in your um, uh, the debtor's house. Florida used to have an absolutely unlimited homestead exemption. It would cause folks to move here prior to filing bankruptcy a year later so that they could take, take advantage of Florida's unlimited homestead exemption. They essentially convert assets that would otherwise have been not exempt into an exempt uh, homestead in order to keep that away from their creditors when they subsequently file bankruptcy. It was planning. Now, now the test is, is longer. Um, it takes 40 months before you can achieve essentially the same thing in Florida, which is it's three years and four months rather, rather than just the greater part of a year. Um, but then there are a lot of other limitations uh, that, are, that are much smaller than this very large uh, exemption that Florida provides for its longer term citizens as versus short-term citizens. So if you're thinking about uh, whether or not somebody is going to be eligible for bankruptcy, or if you yourself are looking into whether or not you're eligible for a bankruptcy, bearing in mind, once again, that generally speaking, student loans cannot be discharged in a bankruptcy, um, you have to make sure that you examine very, very carefully the exemption schemes that, that are available or not available uh, to a particular debtor. Okay, so the creditors meeting, which is known as a 341 meeting after the um, section of the bankruptcy code that establishes the need for a creditors meeting. Uh, has to be called within 40 days after the time the petition is, is filed by the trustee. Uh, right now, 341 meetings are under a moratorium because of the coronavirus um, effects. So there's apparently some ability for the court to stretch that 40-day 
limitation based on uh, exigent circumstances. Uh, in order to receive a portion of the debtor's estate, each creditor will normally file a proof of claim with the bankruptcy court clerk within 90 days following that 341 meeting. And in cases that are called no asset cases, where all the assets of the um, debtor are either are either subject to secured loans um, or uh, are exempt property, the unsecured creditors are going to receive no payment, and most of their debts, if not all, are going to be discharged. Okay, so how does property get distributed? Well, first and foremost, secured creditors are going to get paid over the unsecured creditors to, to the proceeds because there is secured collateral, um, which is there to protect the secured creditors. Uh, to the extent that a secured creditor's claim isn't satisfied by the secured collateral, then that secured creditor will become an unsecured creditor for the balance. So uh, you can have a $20,000 claim that is secured by a $10,000 automobile. The first $10,000 of your claim is secured. The second $10,000 is unsecured because the value of the collateral is not sufficient to cover the entire claim. Now, if the collateral is surrendered to the secured party, the secured creditor can either accept the collateral in full satisfaction of the debt, or they can sell the collateral and use the proceeds to pay off the debt. After paying all of the administrative expenses, associated with the bankruptcy, including the court costs, trustees' fees, and attorneys' fees, that would be trustee attorneys' fees, proceeds from the remainder of the estate are distributed among unsecured creditors according to a strict categorization of claims. And again, this is statutory. You need to look and see what it is if you happen to be you know, engaged in the practice of bankruptcy law or if you happen to be um, a creditor who is interested in trying to uh, get whatever you can out of a debtor who has filed bankruptcy. All right, discharge. I had already mentioned before that, generally speaking, student loans are not going to be dischargeable in bankruptcy. What's that mean? Well, it means that you could file a bankruptcy, and at the end of the bankruptcy, um, you're still going to owe those student loans. And there are a lot of other things that, even though you file a bankruptcy, uh, you're still going to owe that amount uh, to the extent that it didn't get paid off uh, by the funds that went through the hands of the trustee and the bankruptcy. So... In general, debts that aren't satisfied by a liquidation are going to be discharged, and the debtor is no longer going to be obligated to repay them. But the exceptions, depending upon individual circumstances, can dictate essentially that the person doesn't necessarily want to file bankruptcy. So claims for back taxes that have accrued within two years prior to the bankruptcy uh, or for amounts that have been borrowed to pay federal taxes or any other non-dischargeable taxes or for any other government fines and penalties are all non-dischargeable, meaning they're still going to be owed at the end of the bankruptcy and indefinitely thereafter. Claims against property or funds obtained by the debtor under false pretenses or by false misrepresentations, or through embezzlement, or larceny, or based on fraud or, or misuse of funds, are also non-dischargeable in bankruptcy. Claims by creditors who did not appear on the schedules the debtor was required to file are non-dischargeable. So, 
um, if you leave somebody out when you're preparing these schedules, when you're preparing the bankruptcy petition and schedules, and you leave somebody off of them, they're not going to receive notice. And so they're not going to be in a position where they could have filed a claim. They're not going to be in a position where they could have shared in whatever there is uh, by way of a bankruptcy dividend, as they call it. And so they're not going to get discharged because you left them out. Domestic support obligations. Again, that's alimony and child support and property settlements. Those are not dischargeable in a bankruptcy. So the guy who owes a bunch of money in child support is still going to owe it on, on the backside of a Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Claims for amounts due on a retirement loan account or on a student loan. And here they say, unless repayment causes undue hardship, I can tell you from personal experience representing somebody uh, that it is very, very difficult to establish an undue hardship on a student loan. It just doesn't happen. Claims that are based on willful or malicious conduct toward another or toward the property of another. An uh, example of that would be drunk driving. And then consumer debts of more than $675 for luxury goods, whatever that is, uh, or services that are owed to a single creditor incurred within 90 days of the order for relief. So I don't know whether that means, uh, you know, a caseload of caviar or what, but it's there as a non-dischargeable uh, debt. Okay, it looks like I got ahead of the slide a bit here, but that's okay. Cash advances that total more than $950 that are extensions of open-end consumer credit obtained by the debtor within 70 days of the order for relief. This is to prevent what is known as a bust-out. So you're going to go get a credit card, uh, get a bunch of uh, cash advances on the credit card, and then turn around and maybe even use those cash advances to pay your attorney and filing fees for your bankruptcy, that's not going to be dischargeable. Uh, judgments against a debtor resulting from the debtor's operation of a motor vehicle, boat, or plane while intoxicated. So that's actually a specific requirement rather than the old test, which was to consider that a person who was driving drunk might have been um, maliciously con uh, conducting himself towards another, because there were some case law that suggested that drunk driving was not willful. Uh, debts that are arising from a violation of securities laws. So once again, the insider trader, uh, yeah, that, they just don't seem to like insider traders uh, uh, in Congress. I don't know why, since a lot of congressmen seem to enjoy insider trading themselves, even during a coronavirus uh, uh, crisis. And student loans, as we mentioned, for what, four or five times already? Uh, unless the payment of the loan imposes an undue hardship, well, guess what? Assume that it is never going to impose an undue hardship. If you've got a student loan, it's not going to be dischargeable in bankruptcy. All right. Let's go over the statutory reasons why courts deny a discharge. The debtor can conceal or destroy property with the intent to hinder, delay, or defraud a creditor. Uh, in the past, uh, there were a lot of occasions when a debtor would fail to report things like jewelry that belonged to them. And I remember in particular one case um, that occurred here in Jacksonville, I'm sure it occurred everywhere, uh, where a debtor who um, went to his 341 meeting, the meeting of creditors, 
um, wearing a Rolex watch, um, trustee noticed that they had failed to report that on their schedules. And obviously, that was concealment of property with the intent to hinder, delay, or defraud a creditor. Uh, the debtor's fraudulent concealment or destruction of financial records, which now, uh, by extension, if the debtor even fails to turn over income tax records, they're going to be denied a discharge. Uh, the granting of a discharge to the debtor within eight years prior to the filing of the petition, you cannot get a discharge in a Chapter 7 bankruptcy any more frequently than once every eight years, um, or, or a discharge from a Chapter 13 for that matter. So if you have already previously received a discharge in bankruptcy as a debtor, um, you file again, you're not going to get a discharge until eight years has gone by. Uh, the debtor's failure to complete uh, required consumer education course. Uh, it's a very simple matter. I mean, that's really something that, that uh, no debtor has an excuse for not completing that course. Uh, if the debtor is currently involved in proceedings that may result in being uh, convicted of a felony, then that can form the basis of the court to deny a discharge. Uh, bankruptcy court can also revoke the debtor's discharge within a year if it is discovered that the debtor was fraudulent or dishonest during the bankruptcy proceedings. The affirmation of debt. So a debtor may voluntarily agree to pay off a debt even though the debt could be discharged in bankruptcy. An agreement to do so is called a reaffirmation agreement, and it must be made before the debt is discharged in bankruptcy, and it must be filed with the bankruptcy court. Uh, the reaffirmation agreement must disclose the amount of the debt reaffirmed, the rate of interest, the date payments begin, and the right to rescind. Typically, in fact, not just typically, almost invariably, a reaffirmation agreement is going to be uh, regarding a secured debt. Reaffirmation agreements are extremely common when it comes to automobiles, say, where the debtor wants to retain the automobile even though uh, there is a debt on the automobile and they're making monthly payments. Um, mortgages as well may be subject to reaffirmation agreement if the debtor wants to continue to live in that house. Okay, we're going to spend a couple of minutes talking about Chapter 11, which is a reorganization. Generally speaking, Chapter 11s are business bankruptcies filed by a business that is in distress where the business is has the intention of remaining operational after the reorganization. Chapter 11s can be filed by individuals um, as a payment plan or repayment plan uh, under circumstances where they owe so much money they don't qualify for a Chapter 13 plan. Um, but, by and large, they're going to be considered to be uh, a business reorganization. The type of bankruptcy proceeding that is used most commonly by corporate debtors. Um, and so, creditors and the debtor formulate a plan under which the debtor pays a portion of its debts. The rest of the debts are discharged. Um, the debtor is allowed to continue in business. That's considered to be mutually beneficial. We look at a number of instances, for example, where the current president of the United States went through bankruptcy proceedings that accomplished this. Same principles that govern the filing of a liquidation apply to reorganization proceedings. Thus, the case can be either voluntary or involuntary. 
automatic stay provision and its exceptions apply in reorganizations as do provisions regarding substantial abuse and additional grounds for dismissal or conversion of bankruptcy petitions. Conversion essentially is coming in and saying, okay, this chapter 13 or chapter 11 in this case uh, is not going to be viable. We're going to turn you into a chapter 7 and liquidate you. In some instances, to avoid bankruptcy proceedings, creditors may prefer private negotiated adjustments of creditor-debtor relations known as workouts. Once a petition for Chapter 11 has been filed, the bankruptcy court can dismiss or suspend all proceedings in a case at any time if dismissal or suspension um, would better serve the interests of the creditors. Code also allows the court, after notice in the hearing, to dismiss a reorganization case for cause when there is no reasonable likelihood of re rehabilitation. Uh, similarly, a court can dismiss a Chapter 11 petition where there is an inability to affect the plan or an unreasonable delay by the debtor that may harm the interests of creditors. On entry of the order of relief, the debtor in a Chapter 11 proceeding generally continues to operate the business as a debtor in possession. DIP. I don't recall ever seeing the debtor in possession called a dip, but I suppose they might be. Uh, similar to the appointment of a trustee in a liquidation, uh, the trustee may, the court may appoint a trustee who's often referred to as a receiver to operate the debtor's business if gross mismanagement of the business is shown or if appointing a trustee is in the best interest of the estate. But, by and large, that's not going to happen because the point of filing a Chapter 11 is that the debtor does remain in possession. A committee of unsecured creditors will be appointed to consult with the trustee or the debtor in possession regarding the debtor's reorganization. And there are a bunch of requirements uh, for that and, you know, who, ha who gets to be on the committee and who doesn't. Okay, we're still talking about Chapter 11s here. Uh, reorganization plan is meant to conserve and administer the debtor's assets in the hope of an eventual return to successful operation. The plan must designate classes of claims and interests, specify the treatment to be afforded to each class, provide an adequate means for execution, and pay all tax claims over a five-year period. Only the debtor may file a plan within the first 120 days after the date of the order for relief. This period can be extended but not beyond 18 months from the date of the order for relief. For the plan to be adopted, the various creditor classes must agree to the plan and the bankruptcy court must confirm it. So cram down provisions. Once it, at least one class of creditors has agreed to a plan, the court may confirm it over the objections of other creditors as long as the plan does not discriminate unfairly against any creditors. For non-individual debtors, discharge occurs upon confirmation. An individual debtor is not discharged until they complete their plan. Because as I say, in effect, it is a substitution for a Chapter 13 plan for somebody whose debts are too large to follow Chapter 13. Speaking of Chapter 13s, and I guess Chapter 12s as well, individuals, not partnerships or corporations, with regular income who have fixed unsecured debts of less than $394,725, or fixed secured debts of less than $1,184,200, and again, these numbers go up every year, may take advantage of bankruptcy repayment plans. Salaried employees and sole proprietors, as well as individuals who live on welfare, social security, fixed pensions, or investment income are among those eligible. 
A Chapter 13 repayment plan case can be initiated only by the debtor's filing of a voluntary petition or by a court conversion of a Chapter 7 petition, and a trustee must be appointed. Certain Chapter 7 and Chapter 11 cases may be converted to Chapter 13 with the debtor's consent. The debtor's repayment plan must turn over to the trustee any future earnings or income needed to fulfill the plan, provide for full payment of all priority claims within the plan period, and provide identical treatment for all claims within a particular class. The debtor has to begin making plan payments within 30 days after the filing of the plan. Failure to make timely payments is grounds for the court to convert the case to a liquidation or to dismiss the petition. The length of the payment plan can be three years or five years, depending on the debtor's family income. The court will confirm a plan after a confirmation hearing if the secured creditors have accepted the plan. The plan provides that secured creditors retain their liens until there is payment in full or until the debtor receives a discharge, or the debtor surrenders the property securing the claims to the creditors. After the debtor has completed all of their payments in their Chapter 13 repayment plan, the court grants a discharge of all debts provided for by the repayment plan, except for the following. Allowed claims that are not provided for by the plan. Certain long-term debts provided for by the plan. Certain tax claims and payments on retirement accounts. Claims for domestic support obligations. And debts related to injury or property damage caused while driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Last and potentially least from the point of view of uh, folks who live in an urban environment is Chapter 12, Family Farmers and Fishermen. A family farmer is a person or an entity that is at least 50% owned by a farm family whose gross income is at least 50% farm dependent and whose debts which may not total more than $4,153,150, are at least 50% farm related. A family fisherman is a person or entity that is at least 50% owned by a family engaged in commercial fishing, whose gross income is at least 50% dependent on commercial fishing operations and whose debts which may not total more than $1,924,550, are at least 80% related to commercial fishing operations. Once again, these numbers uh, are indexed and go up year by year. The procedure for a family farmer or fisherman bankruptcy under Chapter 12 of the Bankruptcy Code is essentially the same as for Chapter 13, Consumer Repayment Bankruptcy. The content of and court confirmation procedure is essentially the same as in Chapter 13. And after the debtor has made all plan payments, the bankruptcy court will discharge all planned debts. Okay, that concludes this chapter on bankruptcy. And while I don't know that you know everything that you need to know or should know as a business major before you go out into the real world uh, regarding bankruptcies, at least, at least maybe now you know something.